Hello, everyone, and welcome to week three of Preventative Health Awareness Month. There's, and today happens to be Healthy Aging Day. This is an area that I am passionate about as not only because I'm a registered massage therapist and have treated thousands of people through my career, but I've also got my professional designation as a consultant in aging. And I have had the distinct pleasure and honor of loving aging parents and um, seeing the importance of that conversation and of caring for those that are aging. And there's never been um, more stats than ever in Canada. And this woman, I'm sure, is going to share some of them with us in terms of our aging population and the impact that's having not only on our system, but on the quality of lives of Canadians. And that's why discussions like we're about to have here today are critically important. So I am super excited to have with me who, what I'd like to say, a, a new friend that I've had over the last year, thanks to Stephanie Vanderbush from Exeter Massage Therapy. Karen Brown, the founder of Brown Healthcare, um, has 25 years of falls and injury prevention expertise. She's an aging in place and accessibility strategist. Um, and is also the owner of renostudios.com, where they produce unbelievable content, podcasts and videos and courses to really help support people who want to age in place with dignity in the type of home they want to place to, to stay in place in, but also to talk about that mindset. And these kinds of conversations are so important. So welcome to FAM and Healthy Aging. This is the second year you've contributed. And Karen, we're so happy you're here. Well, thank you very much for the invitation. I'm delighted to support this wonderful cause. It is fantastic how everybody has come together to put content out there for people to be, as you say, the CEO of their health. Indeed, indeed. There's never been a more important time for us to feel more empowered, especially when there's a lack of resources, there's an aging population, and there's a lot of fear around not being able to access care. How is this going to impact me? And my family. So let's talk a little bit, Karen, right? And I know this is right in your wheelhouse of passion. Your why. Let's talk about some of those stats around, you know, the reason we're having this conversation. Why, why don't we start there? Sure. Um, I'll reference the current uh, survey that was done on disability in Canada. There was a survey done in 2017. It was repeated in 2022. So it's pretty current data that we have that gets to compare those two. And what we know is that nearly one quarter of Canadians of working age have a disability of some kind. Mm -hmm. um, 65 and over, 40.4% of people are reporting a disability. Now, the most common disability reported is pain related. Are we surprised yes. about that? You're not. No. Not in the no. uh, not in the profession that I'm in. I treat it on a daily basis, right? Mental and physical pain. Absolutely. Right. And then number two is flexibility. And number three is mobility. So I, I don't think people would have really thought that those were the disabilities that people would report. Right. But that is, in fact, what Canadians are reporting. And so it is really, really important that we understand that that is already out there. Set that aside for a second. Life happens. People mm -hmm. break legs. People have sciatica, you know, the football injury from college sort of scenario. Um, all of these things come into play in our lives. And it's really, really important that whether you have a progressive disease, a chronic condition, or something that happens unexpectedly, thinking mm -hmm. hip replacement, knee replacement, you fall on ice and break your shoulder, these kinds of things. It is really, really important to mm -hmm. think about how you live your life and to be making decisions that will accommodate not only the good times, but what might happen down the road. Exactly. All you have to do is look at your grandparents and see the issues that they have moving around, mobility, pain, flexibility. We all lose range of motion as we age. We don't have to. Correct. As this is within our control. We can do yoga. We can do all kinds of exercises. We can get massages regularly, which I do. Yes. Um, and, and that is actually something that helps a great deal with my flexibility. Yeah. So there are all kinds of things that we can do 
it's a choice. We don't always, but why we need to do things is really important. Exactly. And I think what you're raising also is the whole, this whole idea of prevention, which is what this entire movement is about. And prevention, not only from what are we going to do, but how are we going to think about things and how are we going to put things into place, even with conversations within intergenerational family, um, to, to have these conversations so that it doesn't seem so scary when we're in a crisis, when someone does have that fall or when someone does break a hip or or whatever the case may be, I think, and that's what I wanted for this day when we talk about health aging, it is really to talk also about making it okay to have conversations and to plan ahead. You know, people like you, this is what you do on a day-to-day -day basis, is help to, at a person's pace, within their budget, with their lifestyle in mind, really helping them to make some decisions for themselves as they progress through life so that we can mitigate or prevent real tragedies or unbelievable undue stress, not just on the aging person, but their whole village and, and surrounding um, support systems as well. I'm sure you see that a lot. I do see that a great deal. And, and what I typically encounter in the initial phases is people who are frozen in fear. Yes, yes. They don't know what to do. They don't know where to start. They don't know who to call. I mean, there aren't a lot of people around like me. I'm actually currently working on a project remotely. The client is in California and, mm -hmm. and I'm working remotely uh, on this project with them. So, you know, if, if people are working with a healthcare team, an occupational therapist, yeah. that's a good place to start. Absolutely. But just within your own life you start looking at how you live your life how do you want to live your life you know if you're 50 years old now what's in your mind about how you picture living your life when you are in your 70s 80s 90s right how do you socialize how do you engage with other people how do you get to your appointments um, how do you move around your house how what brings you, you joy? Yeah, I think even look, yeah. being as simple as, and I think people don't really think like this, but in our day to day, what really brings you joy? Because those are the things we should be focusing on because to support our environment that we're living in as we age, we do have to focus on those things so that you can continue to do those things that bring you joy in a safe way because that impacts both mental and physical well-being. The social determinants of, the, of health is a big thing. We all saw the impact of that and still the fallout of it, you know, as we continue to walk through this post-pandemic, it's not even post-pandemic world. So I think you're right in, in really starting to think about this. We don't think, we, we act once we have to. And that's what this whole concept of changing the mindset, you know, the beginning of February and the end of February, we're calling it mind. Um, mindset and health esteem because we need to change that because we've been wired to wait till something's broken or wired until we have to make a decision rather than to give us some time to think about it talk about it. and I think you're right like let's really talk about that fear it, fear is real for people that's why people don't go get a mammogram because what if they find something or they don't get their colon cancer checked we're going to have a, we just had a whole day on cancer for prevention it's really important. Fear plays into this too, doesn't it? Fear is a really big thing. Um, the, the fear of what they might tell me and right. the fear of aging, the fear of growing older. Uh, for those with uh, chronic conditions or progressive diseases, the, the fear is amplified, of course, mm -hmm. and with, with good reason. But we all need to find ways to conquer that fear and move forward. You know, for those of us who have adult children, they come into play too, because I don't know about you, but as I age, yes. I am finding my children have opinions about how I live my life. Right. Yes. Right. And yeah. many of my clients have children who have opinions about how they are living their lives. In a perfect world, everybody would agree, but that's just not the reality of how it happens. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we, we can talk about children a little bit. Yeah. Families are very geographically dispersed these days. It didn't used to be that way when no. our parents were young or our grandparents were young. The nuclear family stayed very close, but now 
because of work conditions and the ability to travel, not to mention technology, yes. families are very dispersed. Yes. So, you know, children definitely are entitled to have opinions about their family and how they live their lives to a point. Of course. As long as the parents are of sound mind, cognitively in good health, and able to make those decisions for themselves, right. it's very difficult to suggest that they ought to allow anybody else to make those decisions, much less their children. But let's understand the children's fears. If your children don't think that you can be safe, if they think that you can't drive your car safely anymore, if if you are forgetting to take your medication, if you're not showing up for appointments because you forgot, they have a legitimate concern. That's right. And there need to be conversations, back to the conversations, yes. there have to be conversations where these issues are discussed openly and honestly over a period of time. It's not a one and done but over right. a period of time and you can put strategies in place to mitigate the fears because if your children have fears, you have fears, you know, when you're not taking medication, you know, the guilt that you feel or the shame that you feel when you miss an appointment or, you know, you should have done something and you forgot. Um, or you're frustrated. You're frustrated with yourself because I think all of us, and I, I mean, I'm only 56 years old, but there's even signs where you think, oh, like 20 years ago, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have stumbled to do that. And now I'm like, it's different. And we get frustrated because we expect in our minds, we think, oh, we've got everything covered. But as we age, it can be challenging. And to your point with kids, I, I, I hope we want, there needs to be a mutual respect both ways because the kids often, and this isn't always every every family, but they're often coming to it with the right intention. They're, like you said, they're concerned. Uh, I think the key is that prevention piece. And over, you said it's not one and done over years or months and slow, gradual changes. If you have an open communication, I always say communication, good communication prevents confrontation. And right because, but it's hard to have hard conversations. It's hard to talk about in our, you know, this is another whole thing we could do together, but death and dying, it's a hard, difficult conversation to have. But I certainly come from this a place, I was blessed to have parents that we, and maybe because I'm an only child, I don't know. I think part of it is because that's who my parents are and they worked very hard to perhaps because their upbringing wasn't quite the same. They wanted an open dialogue with their child. They wanted to have that communication and those hard conversations so that they felt they'd be taking pressure off me. And and they're right, because we do worry. And, and there is a bit of a push and pull, isn't there? Good intended children trying to help their aging parent, but a parent still saying, well, hang on, I'm independent and rightfully so, and I'm going to make my own decisions. And that's that push and pull. And this is where I love what you do, because you sometimes I'm sure are the broker in helping that communication happen. Am I correct? Oh, yes, that that happens. Um, it's not ideally the position I would like to be in, but it definitely happens. And you have to give people the respect to let them have the conversation. It, it's not about my opinion. No. And it's not about what I think is going to be best. It is totally about the elderly person the person with a disability, the person with a chronic condition, they are in charge of their health care. As long as they are cognitively well, yes. they are in charge. And I fully recognize that their children may have one opinion, their health care team may have another, their friends may have yet another opinion. They may Google stuff and find a myriad of opinions out there. So there's a lot of conflicting white noise in their universe. Um, right. But it's ever so important to make sure that you put solutions in place so that you can have the kind of life that you envision for yourself, yes. but that also keep your children comfortable. You know, um, children do 
have to be very comfortable with what happens. Otherwise, their anxiety is going to continue and they it'll be like a constant, never ending, nye, 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 nye. often like what we felt like as parents when our children were growing up. You know, we were always repeating things to our children and they wouldn't remember. It Now it becomes the opposite where children are parenting their parents right. with, with conversations that just never seem to end. So the conversation needs to be such that Solutions are put forward, compromises are reached, and something is operationalized. Something yes. is put in place. Yes. And, and and that'll be good until it's not. Let's be realistic. People's conditions can change. Yeah. The memory changes. Um, but, you know, our, our ability to make those kinds of decisions is time limited. Yes. And... That's that's where things might get dark for people, and that's where they shut down. They they don't want to hear it. But I am telling you, the reality is that you only have so much time to make a decision. And I will give you a good example, and I know that you have one as well. Yes, my grandmother lived in her home that she walked into with her newlywed husband the day that they were married. They lived in it through their 50th anniversary. My grandfather passed away. She continued living in the home by herself. It's a two-story red brick house with a basement. And so the bedrooms were upstairs, the living room, dining room, kitchen on the main floor. And of course the basement was the basement. She was having a nap one afternoon, fell asleep on the couch in the living room. Somebody rang the doorbell and she leapt up off the couch. Her leg had gone to sleep, which mm. she didn't realize she fell broke her leg her shin her ankle multiple places mm -hmm. and she was taken to the hospital and while she was at the hospital the doctors said to her that's it you can't go home again you cannot go back to your home it is not suitable for your lifestyle two-story house there was no way to make a bedroom on the main floor and on and on and on she never went home again. I can't tell you the distress that that brought to her. My God. Also brought a lot of stress to my mother and her sister who had to go through a house with almost 60 years of stuff in it and yeah. clean it out yeah. because they had never done that. It took them months and months and months. But my grandmother wanted to go home and, and just gather a few things, but they knew better. They knew that if she walked in those doors, they'd never get her back out again. So she was she was transferred from the hospital to the long-term care facility where her life continued for a few years and then she passed away. Right. So yeah, that, was a certain, that was a condition where the decision was taken completely out of her hands. She had not made a decision to change her surroundings to better support her needs in life. And this is what happened. And then it was too late. And it was now it became a serious safety issue and she couldn't go back home. And that's why we want to have these discussions. And what I loved about what you said, um, and, and that story of your grandmother is not unfamiliar to many Canadians, that's for sure. No. And now sometimes there's, it's hard to get into long-term care or seniors' homes that they can't afford. And it's a real stressor. And that's why I'm really passionate about what we're doing and wanted to have this conversation with you, Karen, about, so what can we do in the home over the course of time, and you said something that was really, that I really you know, stuck in my head, you know, something may be working for a while and then it won't. And being open to understanding that that's not a failure, but just, you know, how human of us and life will throw us curveballs. But if we're having open conversations, if we have an integrative health team and we're aware because that we have some options and you start to look at them and implement them, A, to either mitigate potential falls or mitigate issues um, but also so that you can make more informed decisions and transition, you may eventually have to go into assisted living. That may be the best circumstance for you and you're mentally may get there. But I think there's something that we all deserve. And you said it because that's your mission. You want everybody to have dignity. And I, which I, I feel aging. I want people to feel that they're aging with dignity and with some empowerment. And sometimes yes. our fear stops us from being empowered because it's overwhelming. We don't know where to look. I don't know where to start. It seems like a tsunami. And that's what, so can we talk just briefly? Cause I know we could do another whole podcast on, 
on what could you do in your home. And we're going to talk a little bit more of that. We're, we're coming back with Karen. Don't you worry. We're doing another podcast with her. But just at a high level, some simple changes before somebody even needs, for, for example, a chairlift in their house or a ramp. Say they're mobile, but when you're thinking about falls and fracture prevention, or if you're thinking about, you know, living safely and independently in your home, what are some small, simple things that don't cost a lot that people might not think of that they could do to put themselves in the best position possible? Well, I can I can tell you a few free things, and, and we're okay. going to do this in another podcast as well, but I can tell you some free yeah. things. Pick up the throw rugs. Yes. Get rid of them. They are, they are the devil. <laughs> Yes. You, they're pretty. Them. They're pretty, they're but pretty, they're pretty dangerous. They define, they define spaces. Now, I'm um, I'm a little more in favor of the new, not to promote a brand because I'm not sponsored by anybody, but the ruggable ones that have yes. the under padding. Yeah, yep. they are marginally better. Yeah, but but they can still be tripped over. Yes. I have them in my home, and and the the odd time, you know, I do trip over a lip or something, but you know, I don't fall. So I'm not at that point in my life yet, but throw rugs, pick them up, get rid of them. They're not a good thing. Same goes for carpet. Carpet is not a good uh, surface to walk on. So to the extent that you can get rid of that kind of walking surface. Um, also the transitions between rooms, you know, that little quarter inch, quarter round yeah. piece of yes. wood. Don't like them. The transition needs to be smooth. You can look at your footwear. How many of us have that, oh my gosh, the comfortable pair of slippers, but the tread is absolutely bald because you've had it for so many years. Mm -hmm. Same with your shoes, same with your boots. You've got to look at the tread on your footwear every single year. And Karen, our- I, have, I have to interject because I have a personal story. Rest my father's soul. I love him to death. Uh, love him to death. I love him to pieces. Um, in November, before he passed away, he came to my home for my son's birthday. And my my mom and dad, you know, their grandkids are everything to them. And my dad was always a guy to be dressed to a T, always looked his best. It didn't matter when he was 88 or when he was 18. He, you had a nice crisp shirt. You had nice Italian shoes. And he fought my mother that he wanted to wear these Italian shoes on a November day to a birthday party for his grandson at our home. Yep. So unfortunately, coming into our house, because there's no proper tread, he went down and fractured his his humerus. Um, this is not uncommon. And, and how human of us, you know, whether you're 88 or you're 18, we want to look our best, we want to feel our best, we want to feel young. And that's important. But I think sometimes we do have to have that mindset shift that I also want to live well until I take my last breath and therefore making some of these changes, small changes, like you said, and this is why we're talking about it. And as a therapist, this is what I talk about all the time. Balance is another one. You know, doing your balance exercises. My mom's 81 and does have osteoporosis. She religiously does her balance exercises and which is important. And her you know, working her muscles and all the things necessary that we lose as we age, right? We lose muscle mass or copenia and that can lead to falls. So those are some of the things we have in our control, proper nutrition, proper sleep, proper water, all those things. But, you know, when you look at the home, those were some great simple tips. And I know we're going to do a lot more in the next podcast about what else you can do more extensively. I've aging. got so much more to say on this subject for sure. Um, you mentioned hydration. That is really important. Yes. And one of the times last fall, when I went for a massage, my therapist said, your skin is hard. You need to drink more. And so my motivation, it's actually it's sitting right here with me. I've got my, my Stanley yeah. because it, it holds 40 ounces. And so this was my motive. It, be, it becomes a goal because you know that this holds 40 ounces. And so the goal is to get through this, not once, not twice, but three times. I'm not up to three times yet. I'm going to be perfectly honest with you. Yeah. I am, not. but it's it's a goal. And knowing that I've got this huge container, I don't have to measure eight ounce glasses. Like, and I'm you know go to the sink and get, get no. This thing comes everywhere with me. It holds the cold really really well. Nice. And I ended up buying them for all of my staff 
and for my daughters as well for Christmas, yeah. because yeah. that's just so important. Absolutely. And I mean, dehydrated muscle develop trigger points easier than hydrated muscle. Um, so that's how we reduce pain. We talk, you know, we talk about what's some of the biggest disabilities in Canada, pain. Um, simple things we have control over and also cognition, especially as we age, dehydration. People don't realize dehydration can cause you to be dizzy. It can cause you to not have cognition the way you, you would otherwise. And so simply making sure you're hydrated and it's easy to not do that, especially if you're a senior living on your own and you, you know, you just forget or you're not feeling well and you forget to drink. My mom is, uh, she always drinks water. She was sick before the Christmas, like half the world was. And boy, oh boy, you can dehydrate pretty quickly when you're not feeling well, you're by yourself and you're forgetting to drink. And the way it makes you feel, the minute, you know, they hydrate you, all of a sudden you've come to life. It, it's literally like a shriveled, you know, grape and all of a sudden it's plump and, and you're alive again. So I think we, there's little things, um, and although we're, you know, talking about renos here, but that is also helping to live at home safely and also helping your kids not worry about you as much when you're, when you're doing it's this a day to day it's a real life reno and that's what my podcast is called and what my television show is called real life reno it's how we think too you have to make that real life renovation to how you think about things now i want to touch on um a couple of things you mentioned you talked about exercise ever yeah. so important yeah and where can you find that? Well, you can find it probably at your local rec center. You can be a member of a Y. If none of those things are there for you financially or you don't have the ability to travel to them, if you have internet, YouTube. YouTube oh. has a stockpile of great energy, or sorry, great exercises, um, yoga, Tai Chi, all kinds of balance things. And whether you are sitting I mean, chair yoga is a thing. You just put in the search bar chair yoga or standing Absolutely. and you need to hold on to something or whether you can stand independently. These things are available to you for free as long as you have an internet connection. And most people do these days. Totally. The other thing I wanted to touch on was the fall that your father had. Um, falls are something that once older people start to do that, they are very reluctant to admit it yes oftentimes a fall will start with the ability to put your arms out and break the fall yeah. you might break a wrist yeah. next time you fall your wrist won't have the ability to support you so it might be the elbow or the shoulder and ultimately those things won't support you either and it will be a hip it it doesn't get better it goes mm -hmm. from one thing to another and gets worse and worse and worse 50% of falls at least happen within the home. So yes. don't think they just happen outdoors. That's simply not the case. Also understand that most falls are preventable. Yes. If you have proper footwear, if you're outside in the winter, um, go look at the Toronto Rehab Institute. They have a lab that tests footwear. I'm not sure that they've done it in the recent year or two, but they did, I know, three years ago. And they released their top five, I believe, winter boots. I that went is. and got the number one boot. They were at Mark's Work Warehouse. I went and got them right away because they were the one that was going to be best on snowy and icy conditions, which of course are what we have in Canada and in Ontario in the part of Ontario. That's a where fantastic nugget and tip. You know what we're going to do um, in the notes of the show, we're going to make sure we put a link. I'll, t I'll check that out and see if they do have it updated because that's just a practical, really great tip. Um, and it something you can empower you to do or your kids can, you know, buy them for you, um, you know, to make sure that you're going to be safe. That's a great tip. Yeah, there are all kinds of things like that, that that people can do. But the, the crux of the matter is taking your own power. If yes. you are fearful, you are giving power to the fear. You need to take that back and take your own power to take charge of your life. Make the decisions about where you will live, how you will live, how you will go day to day. Proper hydration is a decision. Proper exercise and sleep is, they're all decisions. Yep. The reality is that decisions sometimes have to be made every day, every week, every month. And if you don't make them, somebody will. That's right. That's right. And we want you to be the one to be able to make those decisions. And sometimes in consultation with others, that's important. 
and always with help of others to execute. That's what being better together is all about. And that's what this, I'm so passionate about the work we're doing and so proud of the work that we're doing with Preventative Health Awareness Month and movement. Because this isn't just about a month long campaign once a year. This is about really practically stocking Canadians toolboxes so they can improve their health esteem, feel more empowered to advocate for themselves, know the questions to ask, know the people to reach out to so they can live well as they deserve to at every age and stage of life into their 80s and 90s and beyond. Because here's what I do know as a therapist, and I'm sure you see this regularly in your work. People are living longer, but the reality is many, many people aren't living well. I want to change that. Just because we live longer in life, I want people to live well. And that means mentally, physically, emotionally, spiritually, socially, all of the things so that we can literally feel fulfilled in the way that we're living with the expectations. And I, I know this takes time and mindset shift because it's hard to transition. Um, my mother just said something to me today. We were out and, and, and it's, it's the recognition that, oh, I tire a little bit easier. But then her very next, her very next thing she said, which I find inspirational, and this makes me tearful, is that, but this will probably pass too. You know, she was recently sick. That's her attitude. And attitude makes a massive difference. But the acknowledgement that, yeah, I'm not, you know, she'll be 81 next month. Um, and she's had, you know, she's had, she's had two vertebral fractures and she's recovered from that with all the work. She lives independently in her home. She does everything she possibly can to help herself. But she's also recognizing when she just needs to say, hmm, I need to slow down today or I'm going to rest today because I am not up to this. And that's prevention at its best. Because it's yeah. usually when we are tired or we're overwhelmed or whatever that is, and we're not at our best, where these accidents can happen. So I just thought I would share that with everybody because I know that it can be hard as we transition together through the ages and stages of life as families. And um, it's, I, I'm blessed. I, I, I have uh, parents that have taught me a lot about how to age gracefully but tenaciously and to live well till you take your last breath. Um, sometimes that's not possible. Uh, people, you know, have a lot of different reasons why things go wrong. But what we can control, that's what these discussions that you and I are having and so many other things are having, that's what we're trying to do. Karen, it's all, I always learn something from you. You've always got great tidbits of information and so much so, everybody. Stay tuned because later today we're coming back with a second episode. We're going to dive deeper into Reno Studios and, you know, some of the things, what can you be doing to age in place at home? What does that look like? Is there funding for it? Um, what can you do to help yourself um, live well as we age? Thanks for coming, Karen. Thank you for having me. And you're going to be back, right? We're coming back later today. Absolutely. You bet. All right. Thanks, everybody. Um, stay tuned because we've got lots more great content on Preventative Health Awareness Month and movement. Um, just so honored to have so many great guests. And, and practitioners really, really dedicated to helping you become the CEO of your health. Stay well, everybody.